uh, all I knew was doctors and nurses and things like that when you when you speak, speak about in high school. So um, I learned that there were traders that didn't reside in New York on the stock exchange floor. I, I learned that we traded commodities that were not just uh, silver and gold, but we actually traded commodities like oil and gas um, and the different, infra different parts of the infrastructure that we have here in the country. Um, moving those products by pipeline, moving those products by rail car, and moving those products in the marine space. So I worked my way up from a receptionist to my current role, which is uh, I've recently, I'm recently, tra I'm, I'm transitioning into a new role um, as a freight transformation lead at Shell, which is basically we are combining our organizations marine and transport, transportation space from the Shell Chemical Company and the Shell Trading Company having one face to the market moving all of our molecules. So what I am recently tasked with is creating a new business unit uh, of the two combined organizations with new processes and new systems to move our molecules across the Americas. Um, and in doing that, you know, it's pulled on all of these jobs that I've had as I've worked my way up across uh, the, the maritime landscape. Um, so I started off as a receptionist on a tray floor. Uh, I worked my way up at Kinder Morgan, then I, then, I, then I was an admin before at Texaco, Environmental Health and Safety, working on the upstream projects. Um, I back when Mad Dog was a, a project and not just a, a, a huge platform in the Gulf of Mexico, but supporting those operations. Um, I worked as a demurrage analyst. So typically, whenever we have move our molecules from one place to another, when the ships load and transfer, there's a contractual obligation about the amount of time allocated and doing the analytics and calculations behind those movements to doing the contracts for those trades, being a contract administrator. So working with the traders when they actually negotiate these trades, formulating those discussions into a formal contract that we abide by, both parties abide by, and executing for the company, um, to moving into more of the marine space, from doing the demurrage and the contracts to the actual operations of the marine tankers that we manage. Um, and I've done this for Total. Um, I spent five years there. I've done this at Sitco, at Sitco Petroleum. I worked there about nine years. Um, I worked uh, at a trading house, Trafigura. Uh, I've in, I'm in my sixth year at Shell, um, and I've been in this industry directly in operations for the past 15 years, and I've been in the industry maybe 20, 22, 23 years. Um, so I've seen a lot in this space, but there's so many opportunities for the students in the Maritime College at TSU. Uh, there's so many different uh, places where a graduate meets the skill sets for contract administrators, understanding the trading that we do, for demurrage analysts, understanding uh, uh, the maritime space and the contracts behind the maritime space and the charter parties. Um, schedulers actually moving the molecules. There's so many different just within Shell as it relates to the maritime industry. There's so many career paths that your graduates can take, um, all of them providing pretty pretty uh, reasonable salaries and lifestyles that come along with, with those with those graduate with those with those career with those career paths. Um, for me, um, one of the things that I've learned or one of the things that I've that's helped me grow in my career is always having a partner, having a stakeholder, um, having a mentor uh, to work with you and help you grow and develop. Even as a student, I would always partner. A lot of the times, I mean, I work during the day, so a lot of my classes were during the evenings. But you will find that a lot of your professors may be adjunct professors that, that may work in the industry that you're trying to, to, to break out into. Um, these are people that are well versed or, or well connected with the communities that you want to, to work with. Uh, partner with these people, learn from these people, not only just what's, what's given to you out of the book and in the classroom, but uh, 
keep up with the actual industries that you want to pursue. So dig into some of the maritime incidents and things that have occurred in, in, in recent years. If you look at shipping and maritime, I always joke that, you know, shipping and prostitution are the oldest industries in the world. And at the end of the day, uh, they'll probably still be around. We're not we're not going to promote the other one, but I will be a, a proud advocate for shipping. Um, so uh, I, uh, takeaways that I would give, um, I have a few things that I want to share about my organization. And I'm going to share with my screen with you. And just kind of walk. walk you through some of the things that we do here at Shell. So I've supported or I support and current I, I supported and currently support two different organizations within Shell, uh, the Trading and Supply Freight Operations Team, and I also support the, the Shell Shipping and Maritime Group. Um, we've had my introduction. I, I like to start all of our meetings with a safety moment, whether it's and 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 for you guys, particularly at the, in this culture of COVID, we'll just share a safety moment of ensuring that you take care during these times. Wear your face masks when you're in public. Um, if if you feel so inclined, you know I highly recommend getting the vaccine. Some people do not, but if you do not get the vaccine, please you know. Be, take due diligence and be careful um, with all of the health requirements around prevention of, of transferring COVID. I've, I've lost some family members to it. So. Um, so with that, we'll move on into overview of freight trading and freight operations. And we do offer internships. Uh, the past couple of years, we've been going through a lot of transition in the organization, but I did want to share what our internships requirements are. Um, such that when we do offer them, I will be working directly with Ursula, letting her know when when we post opportunities for interns um, so that you can take advantage of those opportunities. So just at a very high level, uh, I'll discuss the shipping and maritime function for Shell. Um, we are the expert for anything that floats for Shell shipping and maritime, whether it's upstream of the organization, and when I say upstream, I mean um, for the drilling and exploration part where we discover oil and gas versus the downstream organization where that molecules or those molecules are refined or trans transformed into things that are usable or consumed by our, stake that are by our customers and stakeholders. Um, but the shipping and maritime function manage a fleet of about Currently, around 40 LNG carriers, that fleet is constantly growing as we move through the energy transition. Um, and we have 10 oil tankers that we actually own and we staff such that the, the, the crew members and the captains are Shell employees. Uh, we have more than 240 oil and, and LNG vessel tankers on time charter that we manage. Um, we employ more than 1,000 marine officers. And we also employ more than a thousand seafarers, um, but we also employ, I want to say in Houston, I believe two thousand commercial people behind these mariners that are at sea. So every maritime graduate or every maritime uh, student does not necessarily have to go to sea and sail on a ship. I never did in my career. There are plenty of commercial opportunities. Um, and corporate opportunities to explore um, with that background and with that degree plan. But uh, there are around 2,000 vessels on the water on any given day that somebody within Shell is touching or managing or dealing with in some way. Um, that team, we have a commercial group as part of that team, and they are the single market interface within the group to move our products. Uh, we have an agreement within internally for our internal businesses to provide marine transportation, 
Um, whereas we have a freight trading team, the other team that I alluded to that I'll speak about shortly, that handles all of our international freight movements. The, the Cisco shipping team does the uh, domestic shipping operations within the uh, within North America. So I'm sure you'll learn learn about the Jones Act and the delineation between the international side of the business and the domestic side of the business where we have more inland barging and also we have some 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 tanker business as well so our organization splits out the domestic side of the business versus the international side of the business uh, around the governments for the Jones Act requirements versus the international uh, trade Um, the second group that I want to share some information with you about is the freight operations team. Um, they're responsible for two things. So the domestic shipping team, they, they do all of the Inland and, and Jones Act work uh, for the Americas, and they do that uh, as a service. So that when I, you saw the note about the SLA, that's the service level agreement. And the freight operations team, they have a little bit of a different mandate. Not only do they service the business and move the oil and gas and crude oil for sale as an enterprise, but they also function as a vessel owner where we charter out our equipment um, as a freight trading business. So just as we trade oil and we trade gasoline and we trade jet fuel and all of the components for consumption, we also trade the actual freight, the actual movement of those goods uh, internally and externally for other counterparties. So it is nothing to us to have Exxon barrels on a shell ship that we're managing to deliver to their end customer. There's nothing to us to have Citgo barrels uh, because we function as a ship owner. Not every organization has uh, a freight operations team that trades freight. Think of us as Uber for tankers. Um, I'm going to stop there because I cover quite a bit of stuff uh, to give an opportunity for people to ask questions if they have any. And feel free to jump off mute. I can't tell if anybody has a hand raised or question. If there's no questions, I'll move on. So when I spoke about freight trading and being Uber for ships, um, we have a few different ways that we do that. And there's a few different mechanisms and ways uh, to discuss how we do this trading. Uh, we manage vessel time charters, we manage voyage charters, and we manage contracts of affreightment. The difference between these things would be as a time charter, think of that as I am taking this vessel or I'm taking this barge or I'm taking this tanker for a set amount of time, say a year, and I'm going to utilize that vessel for a year. A voyage charter is I am going out into the market as it is and taking a position on a ship or taking that ship or barge out for this moment, just for one trip, just for this one voyage. And when you think of a contract of a freightment, think of that as having a partnership or relationship with a company that may have a fleet of ships that they want to market for use. So we may have a contract of a freightment with I'll use Maersk because I think Maersk is probably one of a large name that, that would be recognized. Maersk has tons of ships, but they may have 10 or 15 that they would like to market to Shell to use uh, within their business to take on a contract of a freightment, meaning that we will have a market-based rate that we take that ship. Um, we can select any ship that's in that pool and we we exercise voyages on on those contracts versus going out into the random market to do a voyage charter we can we can have an established relationship with an owner um, the same way we take time charters in we function as an owner so sometimes we take our fleet and we will time charter it out we will do spot voyages on a voyage charter out 
um, and we do consecutive voyage charters as well. So maybe I don't want to necessarily do one trip, one load and one discharge. I may want to do one load and one discharge and pick it up at the same place and, and, and never stop time and, and do a back and forth type situation. Uh, we move clean products, which alludes to any refined uh, product, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, products of those natures. Uh, we move vegetable oil, vegetable oils. Uh, we move dirty products. When we call dirty products, those are products that are not necessarily refined all the way. So uh, crude oil out of the ground, uh, crude oil to the refineries for them to digest and consume for the production of the refinery. Uh, fuel oil, sometimes for the bunkers for ships and sometimes uh, to be refined into other products. Uh, we also manage a full suite of chemicals. So all your benzene, xylene, toluene, and particularly during the, the COVID uh, the COVID interruption that we've had to all businesses, we've shifted uh, production at some of our chemicals facility to, to manufacture hand sanitizers and alcohols. <clears throat> and we transport those as well. We have a variety of different types of ships. Uh, I won't get into all of that, but coasters, Afromax Vs, chemical vessels, uh, uh, also barges as well, uh, and MRs, not listed on here. But we have a variety of vessels that we, we deal with based on where we're going, how much product we need to, to, to move, um, and the, logistics con the, the logistical constraints around the places that we're trying to deliver. Um, so when I spoke about all of the different opportunities and roles that are available on the teams like this, they vary uh, tremendously. So we have freight traders, again, just as we trade oil, gas, diesel, and jet, or gold, or silver, or futures, we trade freight. Um, so there's freight trading opportunities. There are people that manage the ships from the day-to-day -day basis. Um, that are operators that once the contract is set that we've we've chartered a ship to a, to a customer or a stakeholder there's a person that takes that and manages that ship's day-to-day uh, day-to-day um, -day habits or day-to-day -day operations until it completes the voyage uh, when the voyage is done uh, there are people that are analysts that analyze uh, was this trip profitable how does this impact the people L of the organization. Um, what are our cost drivers within this within this voyage? And they also have people that do the demurrage <clears throat> for these trips and manage that. Uh, there are people that manage the the charter parties, which are the actual con contracts in which we uh, take out and we charter or hire these vessels. Um, so there are many different roles within the freight voyage analyst uh, space. Um, there are groups of people that do nothing but buy fuel for these tankers. They purchase bunkers and they handle claims when the bunkers are not on spec or we have issues uh, with fuel. Um, so there are, and then even outside of that circle, there are other roles that that impact this 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 team. But typically, the teams are made up of these four roles, and there are ancillary people outside of that circle that they also support. So when we speak about this, what skill sets are required to, 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 to move into these roles? Um, do you have a maritime background or knowledge about maritime or a maritime transportation degree from TSU? Um, are you particularly uh, keen to have attention to detail? You notice the small things. Um, do you work well with people? Are you easy to build relationships? Um, this is maritime is a very small community, but I like to think of it, I, I call it a very incestuous community. We all end up working and, and dealing with each other in a very small. It's it's, spec, it's specific work. Um, so the skill sets required, you find yourself working on building relationships with people uh, long term. Uh, a lot of my uh, very dear friends are, I've, I've met because of, of the career path I've taken. Are you proactive? Are you a problem solver? Um, anything can happen with a vessel or a barge at any given moment. They're like small little cities and things happen 
and you have to think on your feet about you know resolving these issues in a, in a quick, safe, and efficient way. Um, are you calm under pressure? Um, because there's a lot of a lot of responsibility and a lot of value tied to these movements and a lot of value tied to these uh, these tankers. And when things go wrong, the whole world watches. Um, we saw what happened the past past couple weeks with the Suez Canal. The whole world watched. Uh, whenever there's an oil spill or a ship has an oil spill or explosion, the whole world watches. Uh, so an employee or a person that's very conscientious about uh, cause and effect and are proactive and again calm under pressure. These are these are skills that will be valuable to you um, in a career path like this. Any questions? Hello Ms. Adams, I have a question. Sure. Um one of the main words that you keep using is contracts. So mm -hmm. I, I know one of the, what you're promoting, um, one of the things that you promoted for the students is the, the career opportunities as, as well. But also I wanted to know, do you all have anything as far as like exposing the students to be able to possibly bid on the contracts? So when you speak about contracts and bidding on a contract, what type of contracts would you be referring to? Because and, there's and several. That, mm -hmm. Right, and that's what I'm saying, like the, the access to know what kind of contract that you all, because some, I think now nowadays um, it's all about like owning your own, right? So in, in some point of, of starting a company and being able to um, connect with Shell on, on, on contract opportunities that, that they may have. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, well, definitely. We have, we have, whole departments and people that are uh, whose full-time job is to manage the bids and tenders for different type of contracts and opportunities within Shell. So if that's something that you want to pursue and, and relationships that you would like to pursue in Shell, uh, I will leave my contact details with Ursula and I will partner you with one of our uh, people that manage, manage those relationships. Um, for people that, for entrepreneurs that want to work with Shell or partner with Shell. Um, the contracts that I'm referring to in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this framework are, are like shipping contracts. So if, if you were to own a ship or barge and you wanted to market that ship or barge to Shell to use, uh, then there are bid and tender opportunities available to do that. But just in having a relationship with Shell as a supplier, or uh, or as a contractor with Shell, yeah, we have people that do that, and um, I, I can partner you with with a pathway to that. All right, thank you. But I wanted to make sure did I answer your question? Yes, ma'am, you did. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay, okay. Hi, this my name is Kim Lightfoot. How are you? Hey, I know that name. <laughs> yeah, I work at Stusco with you. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're down there on 12 on the floor, as we say, and I'm up there on 17. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, um, see how the demerge and the other sides can be translated into, you know, going into freight operations. Because I know about three of our analysts did manage to make it over into ops. So I just wanted to see, you know, if you understand, like, how you can sell that part of your resume over into the ops side. For sure, that was my path. So for me, I, I did contract administration and demerge before. I did contract administration and demerge before I moved into the operations space and into the commercial the, the commercial uh, trading space. Um, for for me and my 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 mandate or my conversations with leadership, that is the path you pursue. Um, because as a demerge analyst, you have keen insight on the type of deals that we're negotiating with. You have keen insight on the charter parties and the framework that we do those deals with. And you are Tuesday night's quarterback. So you are looking at the game as it happened in reverse and you're seeing all of the things that may have gone wrong or all the problems that incurred that cost us uh, a commercial exposure or or 
or, or cre would create value from us as an owner in recovering some of those costs. So yes, there is definitely a path uh, to operations from from Demerge. It was my path, and that that talent is looked at. So I'm not sure if you are if you were you in the EMR. Say it again, EMR. W were you in the in the reshape? With no, I'm still a contractor. Yeah, no. Okay. I'm not FTE. Okay. So even as a contractor, those opportunities are still there. I have your details. Um, as we move through reshape and we come out of of this uh, after August. <laughs> so um, we would I didn't mean to laugh, but that. yeah, we're, we're, the future is no, uncertain no, no. right now. Yeah, the future yeah. is very uncertain. So for, for those of you students who may not know, um, and I've had this conversation with Ursula in partnering with PSU, is that typically Shell has since, gosh, since 1920, has taken internships every year uh, and students, and they brought them into their framework and, and opportunities for them to grow with full-time positions into Shell. And last year was the first year ever that Shell did not uh, did not extend uh, new hires at the university level. Typically, they do it every year, um, and we're looking to get back into that pocket, particularly of uh, internships and hiring again after reshape. Uh, with COVID and the energy transition, Shell has gone has gone through a lot of changes and restructuring and preparing to be the energy provider of the future. And they've gone through uh, just restructuring how we do business and consolidating the way we do business. Um, my current role is consolidating between Shell Chemicals, its own organization, and Shell Trading, its own organization, consolidating how we move our molecules into one group. Um, and it's changing the way we work. It's changing the way our departments look. And we've recently kind of gone through a reorganization, which is, which Kimberly is referring to. Um, but yes, after if, after all of the dust settles with the reorg, there will be opportunities out there. So keep my keep my contact information close. For Kim, sure, for I, sure, I, I'll I, be I'll be looking for it. They have Jehovah really blessed me with this job and allowed me to finish. Um, Getting my college degree, I graduated in 2019. I'm in grad school now. So yeah, congratulations! Shella's, thank you, thank Shell has really done me fairly. I have to say so. But thank you, I appreciate. It. I'll make sure we're on LinkedIn together and, and send some messages to you. For sure. Um, any other questions? I have one. Hi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Gidmina Canales, and um, my question is, what was the pace like um, in your time as a analysis and also in your operations role? Is everything like super fast pace, you know, you back to back to yes. back doing things? Yes, yes, yes. So I would say if you, if you like not being bored, if you like coming to work and every day is really and truly a brand new mercy, uh, then the operation space and the trading space is definitely for you. Every voyage that we have, every voyage, fixture that we have, and when I say fixture, I mean voyage, for a barge or a ship is different every time. Even though it's not like the highway where you take the same lane and you make a lift, the routes are inherently the same, but the way you get there can be different. And the road theoretically changes with sea conditions, weather conditions, um, hurricanes, uh, settlement of the rivers. Um, when every season it changes, we have snowfall in the winter. What happens with snowfall? It melts. Where does it fall? All, all rivers flow to the sea. So in the springtime, we deal with really high river conditions from the snowfall in the Illinois Great Lakes area that that that, trip, that water falls into our tributaries and raises the the levels of the Mississippi, which is one of our larger one of our largest commerce areas for inland transportation on the shipping side. 
So when you think about the river rising, the water is rushing to the sea, there's a safety aspect of maintaining, we call it maintaining your heading, but keeping your vessel safely tied up to side while you're doing cargo operations. So if you think you've got the water rushing against you as you've got oil or gasoline flowing into a barge in the middle of a cargo operations, these things are, come up every day. You have weather, you have lightning, you have high wind. Uh, you have people on your on your equipment that get sick. Uh, you have people on, I've had people have a nervous breakdown. I've had people die on a ship. No voyage is the same. No voyage is unique. Uh, each one you are managing and controlling that ship, what it does, how it gets there, how deep it actually sits in the water. There's so many different factors that it is a fast pace because this is, an, this is a business that is a 24-7 type of business. Ships don't, ships don't stop at 5 o'clock and the captain gets off the ship and clock out. That's not the way maritime works. The, the way our, our commerce flows is on a 24-7 type operation. So the pace can be frenetic. Uh, ships break down. Um, and sometimes there's pressure to be at a certain place at a certain time where you're trying to have the ship speed up. There's times when you're trying to slow it down. Um, you're trying to make uh, fuel cost uh, fuel cost decisions on what fuel do I buy, where do I buy it, uh, what are the logistics around doing that and still delivering to my customer on time. So there's many different factors and components and dynamics to the to the to the to the jobs and the roles and all of them are impacted in some way. So when you speak about pace, it is very fast pace um, and there's a lot of things to be thinking about. So if you like to juggle and you are a bit of a firefighter but you're quick on your feet and you don't mind making a decision, then this is definitely a career path for you. Any more questions? I have another one, um, and thank you for your answer. That was awesome. Um, so, um, sorry, it just slipped my mind. <laughs> That's okay. What what type of, um, I guess, like technical skills would you suggest for us to study up on? Or if there was something that you could have learned um, before starting in your positions, what would it be? Oh, wow, great question. Oh, wow. Um, I wish, and, 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 I, and I even have this on my own uh, individual development plan at work. Um, I am a commercial person. I've always been about the dollars and, and, and the margins on our deals and the margins on our fuel burn and spend. Um, I've, I've, I've tried to take more of a beat and understanding on from a technical aspect, how does that impact our safety culture? Um, I would always say to our leadership, uh, and there's some conversations that I've had with very senior leadership, when they're looking to stack or, or build a team, a department, that it is multifaceted, that we have people with strong technical and maritime skills, and we have people that with strong uh, commercial skills and analytical skills. Uh, I wish I had more technical knowledge and not necessarily knowing how to. I would never be the captain of the ship. I'm never going to be behind the wheel. But I want to understand more of how the, the technical aspects of shipping affect me. So when I look at uh, the, the wind speeds, I know the wind speeds, if the winds are high against me, it's going to slow me down. I want to know more about the currents and how they impact uh, our commerce. Particularly for you, I would say learn, I don't even know if TSU offers this, but for one of my science credits, um, I took meteorology. And I'm extremely thankful for that. If they offer a meteorology course, it will be tremendously uh, beneficial to you. Um, or, or there was something that I would recommend that I wish I knew more about. I wish I dug more into my meteorology because it affects maritime so much and how we get places and 
how quickly we get there, um, that is a skill that I wish I had more of uh, beyond my one college course um, and navigation. I, I wish I knew more about those two things from a technical from a technical standpoint. I can look at a chart. I can run you know from a system what the navigation looks like and, and when it looks kind of off, but I can't explain it. Um, and I wish I knew more about that. Any other questions? Uh, yes, you have three from Roseberry Muthra. Um, the first okay. one is in regards. Uh, the first one is in regards to the Jones Act. Do you separate the mariners based on the act, or are they managed under the same banner of shell? And how do you navigate the complexities in relation to the law? Okay, so. As it pertains to the Jones Act, we have some mariners that work on international uh, LNG vessels, and we have some mariners that work on uh, domestic, but very few that work on our domestic space. Um, as, it, as it relates to the Jones Act and Shell, we have it kind of split into two departments. Um, the main difference or delineation that you have with the Jones Act is that you're always going to have an American captain, you're always going to have an American crew, um, and you're always going to have an American owner. So when you're dealing with, uh, and, and they're only going from domestic port to domestic port, so you're going from Houston, New Orleans, New York Harbor, uh, you're calling from one U.S. location to another U.S. location, and your owners and crew members are American. Um, outside of that, the actual process is very much the same. Okay. Uh, there was another question. She had three, right? Yeah, he, he had three. His second one is, what type of accidents occur in your daily operations internationally or domestically, and how are they managed in relation to, for instance, environmental law or otherwise? Wow, dynamic question. So in my career, I try to keep accidents to a, 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 a bare minimum. We actually, our, our man at Shell is goal zero, to have zero incidents. Uh, but things happen sometimes. Um, this wasn't a ship that I was operating, but a few years back, they had a tanker. We had a tanker, uh, an MR, hit the bridge. Uh, coming through in Baton Rouge. And you ask yourself, well, how do you hit a bridge? Well, your average tanker is about five stories high. And you have to maintain that your, what we call your air draft, the space between the top of your ship and the bridge, um, is maintained with a minimum of five feet. Uh, but in this case, when the vessel was transiting through, she the, the river level was different from the time that the vessel went in to discharge the cargo. And by the time she discharged her cargo, if you think about a ship, when she's loaded or she's laden, she's sitting down in the water. And as she alleviates her cargo or discharges her cargo, she rises. And the river in itself rose some more with it when she came back through. So she clipped the bridge. But we have a whole incident team and incident matrix um, that that the operator, once an incident occurs, captain calls the operation and he calls our incident hotline. And we have a team that whose sole job is to manage and mitigate incidents uh, from safety for the public and safety for the people and crew on board. So that that's one particular incident recently that I can kind of think of that I can share with you. Um, oh, now we had another incident where um, we had two vessels off of the West Coast that were light, doing a lightering operation. And for those of you that are not familiar with lightering operations, is when you have two vessels that instead of going to a dock or a berth to load or discharge, you actually have two vessels that are transferring cargo from one ship to another ship at sea. And in order to measure or gauge how much product is in each tank, 
uh, an inspector, an inspector goes out to do that, and there, um, this was a horrible incident where the inspector went out, and he was climbing from uh, the work boat to board the ship, and he, the ship was in rough sea conditions. So when he reached out to grab the Jacob's ladder, the the ship shifted up, and he missed the Jacob's ladder, and he actually fell between the two ships, and. He, we lost one. We lost him, and there was thorough, thorough in, uh, investigations on transferring personnel uh, at sea and in the weather conditions. And now we have new guidelines around how that actually occurs, uh, either with the ship's crane, you know, lowering to to lift that person up instead of him climbing from the Jacob's ladder. Um, but the way our ways of working and our conditions in which we allow uh, those type of operations to happen were really uh, scrutinized and, and updated. Did I did I answer your question? And I think also that jo Joseph that Joseph mm -hmm. actually ha has a question. Okay. Joseph. I can't see the names with the questions, so I appreciate you guys helping me out. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Joseph Harris. I'm currently a uh, maritime student at TSU. I just wanted okay. to know real quick, Ms. Anitra, uh, uh, thank you for, you know, joining this uh, Lunch and Learn today. You're very um, informative with the information. Um, in light of the uh, recent uh, Ever Given container ship, um, mm -hmm. grounding, how did that affect, you know, Shell's freight trading operations and um, did you guys, you know, what sort of backup plans did you guys put in place to, you know, to get around that, you know, um, to, you know, to, to help cut so much loss, you know what I mean? Okay. Uh, solid question. Solid question. So I didn't ask my guys how many of how many of us had vessels waiting to go through the Suez at the time? So when we look at when we load a vessel and we're transiting the Suez or we're looking to 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 to, to transit that route, either going from the Med to to the East via the Suez, we have to re we have to look at our routing plans. So there's two ways to get to the East. You can go through the Suez Canal, or you can burn another you can burn another week or two about a week and a half, I believe, to travel around Africa, around the Cape. So the contingency plan is this. When the Ever Given got stuck, nobody knew how long it was going to take to free her up. Uh, you revert back to your your captain and say, hey, Cap, how many bunkers do you have on board? What is What does my burn look like? Uh, do we have enough to make it around the Cape? And do I have adequate bunker supply once I get around the Cape? Because you got to understand, when that ship is stuck, Everybody with a tanker is waiting to transit the canal or make plans to, to go around. Um, so at that point, every ship that's sitting out there waiting, and I believe there were well over 200, uh, were looking to see if they had adequate, adequate fuel to go around. They're having the discussions with their recipients, their receivers on the other side, saying, hey, we're going to be late. Don't know how late. What is your, what is your, we revert with them to discuss a plan, a voyage plan. Either we modify our voyage plan to go around the Cape or we make a decision to agree and wait uh, for the Suez to get free, for, the, for that vessel to clear and we can transit uh, the Suez Canal. Uh, there, depending on the type of cargo that you have on board, <clears throat> your recipient may have to make uh, they may have to make quick decisions as to whether they need to resupply because resupply their facilities uh, where re, re, resupply their facilities with uh, with with supply that's that's more available to them. So um, several decisions can be taken around that. Um, what vessels, if we were impacted with vessels waiting around the Suez, I am. I'm fairly certain, certain that there was one in our network, at least one. Um, but the decision taken to mitigate the delay uh, 
is decided between the commercial teams and the people that own the product actually on board the ship. If she's in ballasting conditions, then uh, more than likely they w decided to go and take more fuel. But because there were so many vessels waiting, um, they may not have had a choice but to wait. But there are several, there, there's things that you can do. There's options you can take. If you're ballasting and you don't have a voyage, you may reach out and say, I'm going to cancel this voyage and I'm going to trade this ship in the mid where I am or I'll trade this ship from Europe uh, back over to the Americas. Uh, but if she's laden with somebody else's cargo, you have to decide, do I have adequate fuel to maneuver around all the traffic that's here and go around the Cape? Or will my supplier, will my uh, customer be happy with me waiting to go through? But either way, you're looking at your fuel supply and your burn on the ship uh, to, to mitigate your fuel loss. Because as a carrier, as an owner, that fuel consumption is in your pocket. Okay. And let me ask you this. And uh, one more question. Um, sure. As far as your cargo is concerned, would it have been feasible to maybe use air transportation to, to help deliver some of the uh, cargo to your customers? Or would that be just as time consuming and time consuming and uh you know such a financial expense? Well, primarily with the, the types of cargoes that we transfer or that, that we deal with at Shell, it's not really feasible for air transport because of the volume, the volume that we're moving and the sheer weight of it. So if you think about airplanes, they're always they're limiting how many people can be on board. They're limiting how much luggage you can have on board. And particularly with smaller craft, they're actually limiting how much people weigh that they're on the plane. It's all about weight with the, with the plane and be her being able to maintain her position in the air. With the volumes that we're moving and the amount of weight that we're moving, there are not uh, planes that are designed to transport the type of product and the type of volume that we have in the air. So that wouldn't be a feasible for us uh, currently. That's not a feasible method of, of transporting um, our liquid goods or our gas. Okay, yeah, I understand that. I, I was just, I was just wondering, uh, you know, what other kind of, you know, avenues that, that could have been used to help, you know, alleviate some of the backup. No, that's Thank fine. You. You're welcome. Okay. Great. And I think that there is time for possibly one more question. So so does anyone else have have a question? And anyone that has not asked a question. If I don't have questions, I've got what five minutes. I want to cover ten things. I want to share if I can. Okay, go go ahead. Please do. Okay. Um, as a student, and you're starting your professional careers, and you're going out, and you're having these interviews and engagements with companies, um, it it can be difficult, and it can be a little bit daunting sometimes when you're interviewing because you don't have necessarily the the professional repertoire behind you. Uh, but there are 10 things that I want to leave you with to think about when you're going out interviewing for your next role. Uh, think about, uh, and, and these are things that I've, discussions that I've had with leaders at Shell that I wanted to take away and share with you, things that make you stand out in that interview or stand out uh, at that opportunity. Uh, connect with the safety culture of the organization. Uh, typically, people don't think about, you know, it's all about making money, making money, making money, but also people want to do that efficiently and they want to do that safety. So always, even if they you're not asked about the safety question, ask that leader or ask that person that you're interviewing with about the safety culture of that organization, even if it's not maritime. Ask about the safety culture of the organization. I'm sure you're going to leave a lasting impression. Um, think about where you can contribute and add value. Even if it's something that, even if you don't have a, a strong professional background, you might be particularly savvy on social media. You may be particularly savvy um, with networking. Um, and, and, and some of us, mid-career, we, we, we may not necessarily be thinking about those things, but these are things or skills that, that companies are looking to hire, and these are areas where they're looking to grow. Uh, those, those, those skills matter. Um, 
demonstration of core values. So when I say core values, I mean the things that your mama taught you. Being respectful, being man, having manners, uh, being self-motivated. Share how you, how, what brought you to the interview that day and what your expectations are for yourself and ask that leader or ask that uh, interviewer what their expectations are for this person that they're looking to onboard. A lot of times we go to interviews and we, we answer all the questions that are asked of us, but I want you to be mindful to bring your own questions to the table because not only are they interviewing you to join them, you're interviewing them as well to see if you want to be a part of that culture if you want to be a part of that organization. So come prepared with some questions. Uh, do your research on that organization so that you have an informed question. Um, and perhaps you may leave your interviewer with some homework to follow, that you can follow up with. But when you have your follow-up, thank you for the interview and your time. By the way, it was really great discussing this topic with you. Were you able to, you know, share more light you know, leave them with, with something because they're like, oh, okay, this kid is on, the, he's on his stuff. Um, be prepared. You're going to ask, be asked situational questions. Be prepared to ask that question. What was a difficult conversation that you had to have with somebody? And it doesn't matter whether you had it on the job. It could have been on a project where you had a team member that may not have been doing their part or you know, had a, a, someone in your class that you were struggling with a difficult conversation at your job, at work, in your family, or at church. But the, 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 the concept that you can manage when things are not always easy, share those experiences because they go a long way. They lead to management thinking about your capability of balancing situations, making decisions, and being a leader when you need to be. Um, when you're interviewing for a role, I know we all want to be CEO. Some of us don't get there. Some of us may not. Some of us may not want to be the CEO. But when you interview for a role, temper your ambitions and tailor them for the role. The idea is to get the job. Get your foot in the door. But if you're telling that person in, in the interview, well, I'm ready to be your boss tomorrow, they're thinking, well, well shoot, do they want this job or not? So temper your ambitions for the opportunity. And once you make the most of your opportunity, then, you, then you're working on, on growing. But get in the door first. Show how you can be capable and add value in the position offered at the time. Um, and use that role to develop your skills and develop trust between you and the leadership in the organization. And trust me, once you get that trust, you're going to grow in the organization. But don't come in cocky. Um, Network, both internally and externally. So if you are a student, your student organizations matter. Uh, networking with your, 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 your professors and your, your leadership at the school matters. Um, I cannot, cannot highlight this enough. A lot of times it's not necessarily about what you know, it's about who you know. Um, and be a person that someone can vouch for. It's not all about knowing somebody, but it's being of the moral fiber and cal caliber of being a person that does what they say they're going to do, shows up when they're supposed to show up, um, and execute to the best of your ability, not just enough to get by or just to meet the job description. Put your best foot forward. Um, I believe we're at time, but uh, I, I really wanted to thank you guys for this, this opportunity. Um, I, I appreciate you, and, and if I can help in any way, feel free to reach out and ask me questions. I'll leave my contact details with Ursula, and um, God bless you. That's all I got. And I just actually wanted to say thank, thank you so much. This was so insightful. It was so informative. It was absolutely perfect. Thank, thank you for taking the time out of your busy, busy day just to spend it with, with, with our students and with our fa faculty from Texas Southern U University. Hopefully this is the first of many, many 
So it will be. It will be. Yes, 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 yes. All right. And if there is no nothing else, I'm going to stop the recording.